I'd be grateful if you could uh, find Matthew chapter 5 in your Bibles again. That was page 968, I believe. We'll be, uh, we read a whole section, but we'll be looking uh, particularly at verses 13 through 16 this evening. But as we begin, uh, let's pray for God's help as we come to his, his living words. We thank you, gracious God, that in the hands of your Holy Spirit, your word is powerful and effective in our lives. And we pray this evening that you might take it and you might renew us, that you might bring us nearer what we should be as your people. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Where do you fit into the world? We talked last week about the characteristics that mark out people who belong to God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And verses 1 to 12 end on a bit of a downer with talk about persecution and the suggestion that there is a, an uncomfortable tension when it comes to daily life here in the world and belonging to God's kingdom. Is there meant to be this tension? And in the face of this potential for hostility and this uh, not quite fitting in, are we meant then just to sit tight until Jesus comes again, here and part of our world, but not really part of it? Or is there something more for God's people? Well, I think that's the issue that Jesus sets out in verses 13 to 16. And unsurprisingly, God has no intention of us sitting around, twiddling our thumbs, keeping ourselves to ourselves until the kingdom comes. In God's intention, we have a very definite place in the world as it currently is. I've got two things for us to remember. Uh, they're not hard. They're exactly as Jesus says them for us. And the first is this. You are the salt of the earth. Uh, salt of the earth is maybe a phrase we don't hear that often uh, these days. Uh, if you do, maybe you hear it sometimes as a slightly old-fashioned compliment. Uh, he's a great guy, salt of the earth. Now, maybe you imagine somebody possibly in a town up north wearing a flat cap who has a great reputation for work in the community. And somebody who we value, who's reliable, who's helpful, who's well-respected. But Jesus uses the phrase in a rather different way, not least in the fact that actually he says all of his followers are salt of the earth. It's not that they become salt of the earth, that they sort of work their way up to respectability. But if you are a follower of Jesus, you simply are salt. It's built into your identity as Jesus' follower. That might seem like a slightly trivial thing, a slightly obvious thing to point out, but I wonder if sometimes we can be tempted to read the Sermon on the Mount like a, a list of things to, to do and attain and aspire to. But while it certainly does place demands on us, and I think it makes for very challenging, very uncomfortable reading in places, it is not a list of do's and don'ts to get you into the kingdom of heaven. And this means that in these verses, while there is a challenge to be salt, that challenge doesn't mean try hard to be salt, working our way up from unsalty to salty. We start with saltiness. It comes by being Jesus' follower. It's a matter of identity. You are salt. And we are salt to the earth, that is, in our world, in our society. But what exactly does that mean? What does it mean to be salt of the earth? Now, there are a number of things I think we can certainly say. It seems that Jesus expects us to have some sort of effect on society. I think it seems that Jesus expects us to bring something to society that it can't, uh, it can't provide itself, uh, something distinctive. It seems that Jesus expects us to be of benefit to society in some way. Salt is a good thing. But what is it about salt that makes Jesus use it as a picture for us here? I came across a book this week that lists 11 different uses of salt in the ancient world. I don't know how many you can think of these days. 
And I think there's probably a case to be made for a couple of those uses, but I I think probably Jesus has in mind one of the main uses for salt, uh, back then and now, which is flavor. In a world that has turned away from God and is set against him, Jesus' kingdom people bring the flavor of the, the blessed life to the world. We bring the the flavor of God's favor, of life as it should be, because it's life lived under God, and it's his kingdom that will prevail. These are things that are distinctive, and the world is without them if God's people are not in it. They're things that Jesus has just been talking about back in verses 3 through to 10. They're things that I think are, are likely to incur the hostility that Jesus talks about in verses 11 and 12, And I think it probably fits the parallel best with the later verses in 14 to 16. Now, it's not that uh, we bring the flavor and the flavor of the kingdom, and so the world becomes a slightly has a slightly nicer taste to it. Uh, We bring a bit of the king. We don't bring the kingdom for sort of a a little bit of an improvement of the world. But we bring the, the flavor of the kingdom in the sense that the world is able to see, is able to taste the goodness of being part of God's kingdom. We are the salt of the earth as we bring the flavor of God's kingdom to it. Uh, Like the person who serves you in the chip shop, God has sprinkled his people, sprinkled his church into his world to hold out the savor of his kingdom. Now at times the idea of being salt in the world has been applied to all sorts of uh, activities that make the world a better place. But I think if salt is the flavor of God's kingdom, it can't mean doing any old good thing in the world. Rather, it's very closely tied up with living out the the characteristics, the the values that Jesus has already given us in the Beatitudes back in verses 3 to 10. An awareness of our lack of spiritual worth before God. A mourning, a, a grief over sin. A meekness, that is, uh, humility. An appetite for righteousness. Mercy. Uh, pure hearts, that is, a, a, a close correlation between, uh, uh, between our hearts and between the, the person that people see. Peacemaking. It's kingdom people who are salt. And these are the values of the kingdom. And so I think it's the the living out of these values that has a a salty effect out in the world. Now, those things might involve various social programs. They, They might involve some form of political involvement. But at its heart, being salty is about being devoted to Jesus' kingdom values. As we express the things that Jesus outlines in verses 3 to 10, we show off the goodness of the kingdom of heaven to the world. We are salt. But having said that, when you look at verse 13, it's actually mostly negative. He says, uh, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by people. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. And then the rest of this verse is a warning. And I think these familiar words make for some very uncomfortable reading. But why might the salt of the earth lose its saltiness? Why might it lose its flavor? I think probably it's actually tied to the talk of the persecution back in verses 10 to 12. If the characteristics that Jesus outlines in verses 3 to 10 are going to cause trouble for us, if they're going to make people insult you, persecute you, spread lies about you, then it's at least going to be tempting to, to ease off on Jesus' way of life. Maybe to ditch those values entirely, to blend in instead of stand out. I remember when I was a teenager, uh, my friends and I at church were very keen on uh, trying to show the, our, our unbelieving friends that uh, Christians weren't so different and weird after all try and prove to them that they could still relate to us and we were still fun and just because we trusted in Jesus and went to church didn't mean they had to treat us any differently. Now in some ways it's true we should relate well to, uh, to people who aren't Christians and there is a place for breaking down uh, false stereotypes. 
But as I reflect, I wonder how much of that involved skimping on Christian living, involved trying to be the same as everyone else for the sake of an easier time at school. And to do that is to become unsalty. And salt that is not salty is really not salt at all. And to claim to be salt and yet not to be salty is to put us in grave danger. You see, we've ditched our distinctive place in the world. And there is no place, no use in the kingdom for unsalty salt. Jesus says it's thrown out, it's trampled. He warns us about judgment. He warns us about being shut out. At various times, some parts of the church and some church traditions have maybe had a reputation for putting such an emphasis on being separate and distinctive that they almost forget that we are the salt of the earth. But I wonder if for us the risk is the opposite. We're much more likely to be tempted to be pressured into blending into our society, into surrendering our saltiness, into diluting our distinctiveness. You might remember back in November when the Church of England voted not to approve women bishops. David Cameron publicly criticised it and he said the church, I quote, should get with the programme. Now whatever your view on that particular issue, the pressure is there for the church to line up with the trends and the values and the norms of society. And that pressure can come in obvious ways like that, but also in subtle ways. At the things we watch on TV so often sets the agenda for what's normal and what's desirable in terms of sex and relationships, in terms of what we own, in terms of what we aspire to, in terms of values, in terms of right and wrong, and countless other things. One way or another, the things that we watch and the things that we read often seek to define for us what counts as blessed. What should be mourned? What righteousness is? What purity is? Who should get mercy? But as we line ourselves up with those things, we step away from Jesus, away from the kingdom of heaven. We lose our distinctiveness, our flavor, and we put ourselves in the gravest danger. Jesus' challenge is stark. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Be sure that you are living that reality out in your daily life, in your work, in your friendships, in your relationships, in your family life, in your sports club, as you go for coffee. There is great opportunity for these things. And there is great opportunity for failing to do them as well. The last couple of months, I've been uh, two or three times to uh, play five-a-side football with a couple of guys from church and then a bunch of guys who have no connection to church and uh, there are lots of pitches with lots of competitive games going on and in the midst of the competition and sometimes frustration and the winning and the losing and the conversation and the jokes and the banter there is great opportunity I think to be meek and humble to pursue righteousness for uh, a pure-hearted integrity sometimes for peacemaking and mercy and though I haven't experienced any as yet, I could imagine opportunity for persecution. And there is great opportunity to simply blend in. Not to be particularly bad, but to compromise on saltiness, to compromise on distinctiveness. Where will your identity show this week? Jesus says you are the salt of the earth. Well, the second image that Jesus uses for our place in the world is light. And verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. Now, back in chapter 4, Matthew has said that Jesus is a light coming, in, coming to people uh, stuck in deep darkness, people who are cut off from God. And he came bringing the, the tr light of truth about God, the light of God's grace and salvation, the light of God's righteousness and purity. And now Jesus says that actually his followers also have a role in bringing this, this light into a, a dark world. 
And again, this is a statement, not a target for us. That the point is not that we start out as a a 40-watt bulb and over time we work our way up to 100 watts and we're really bright. If we are followers of Jesus, we are. You are light. And he gives us two pictures to help us uh, get, uh, get our heads around what this means. A city on a hill and a lamp in a house. And now the city on a hill might seem like a slightly odd picture in the middle of this. It, it doesn't seem to fit with all this talk about light. But we need to think back to the days before uh, most roads had street lighting on them. When I was a teenager, I used to go on uh, Christian summer camps up in North Wales in the countryside. And uh, we used to have our campsite in a field that was sort of next to a, it wasn't quite a mountain, it was a very large hill. And uh, one year on the last night of camp, we uh, did a, a nighttime climb of this hill. And without a torch, you were completely lost. You stumbled, you couldn't see people, you could hear them, but you had no idea where people were. You had no idea how far it was to go. You could not see. Because actually, out in the countryside of North Wales, there are no street lamps, and there's no residual glow from street lamps that might be nearby, because there aren't any nearby. It is just very, very dark. And so it would have been in Jesus' time. You go out and you travel on the roads at night, and it will be pitch black. Which means that out in the darkness, a city sort of plonked on the top of the hill with people with their their lamps on in their houses at night really is going to stand out. And the same idea is there on on a a domestic scale then. When you go home, you turn on your bedside lamp and you don't then cover it with a thick blanket. Uh, You put it on a table where it lights up the whole room. And so in verse 16, Jesus says, in the same way, Let your light shine before people. Now, I think it is significant here that Jesus makes this slightly negative point and states the obvious. Uh, It might seem a bit obvious to say uh, a city on a hill cannot be hidden and to point out that when you light a lamp, you don't put a bowl over the top of it. I mean, nobody does that. It's ridiculous. But I wonder if... As he, does, as he says those things, as he calls us to let our light shine, we need him to point out how ridiculous it would be not to. Because again, I think we do face the temptation to hide. Back in uh, America, back in America, over in America back in the 1950s, uh, during the early years of the Cold War, Uh, There was massive public paranoia about uh, Russian and communist spies infiltrating society. Uh, The American public were very, very worried about what were called reds under the beds, undercover spies who were uh, just like them, pretending to be them, but uh, actually who belonged to the other side. And again, maybe because of the hostility that these kingdom characteristics can provoke, we are perhaps tempted to try and be undercover Christians quietly looking just like everyone else so as not to arouse suspicion. Certainly the pressure is there. The pressure in our society is to make our faith a very very private matter. Our faith and everything in life that our faith calls us to. To make it such a personal thing that it doesn't intrude into your conversation or your life outside your own home that it doesn't have any relevance to anybody except you. And if it comes out in public, only ever as something that's right for me. And I think it's hard to face the hostility that comes from not doing this. It is tempting to be private about our faith. It is tempting to ease off when it comes to distinctive living. And that's true for each of us, I think, as individuals, but I think it's also true as church. You see, Jesus' statements here are actually corporate statements. He says, you, that is a plural you, all of you are light. We are light as a a church. And it would be easier not to reach out to people with the gospel. It would be easier not to teach uncomfortable things from the Bible. It would be easier not to encourage each other to live the way Jesus calls us to. I remember hearing about a church where uh, a prominent member decided that uh, he would move in with his lady friend. And when this came up at a church leader's meeting, they decided that they weren't going to address the matter because, well, that's just the way things are these days. It is easier to be the same. 
even as a church with a distinctive churchy building. But Jesus makes it clear that God does not have undercover kingdom agents in the world. Citizens of his kingdom are to openly live like it. We are to let our light shine before people. But what does it mean to shine our light? Well, I think the answer comes in the the last part of verse 16. He says, let your light shine before people that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Shining our light is tied up with these good deeds that Jesus talks about. And as is the case with the salty living, I think these good deeds aren't, it's not a catch-all for for any old good thing. Uh, Jesus doesn't suddenly pull the idea of good deeds out of the air. Uh, we We have no reason in Matthew 5 to simply think that his followers are just really nice, helpful people, the the Boy Scouts of the world. I think in context, these good deeds are the the characteristics that Jesus has already laid out back in verses 3 to 10. And they're these characteristics lived out in daily life. One writer puts it really helpfully like this. He says, Kingdom people shining their light refuse to rob their employers by being lazy on the job or rob their employees by succumbing to greed and stinginess. They are the first to help their colleague in difficulty, the last to return a barbed reply. They honestly desire the advancement of others' interests, and they honestly dislike smutty humour. They're transparent in their honesty. They're genuine in their concern. They're meek in personal demeanour, and they are bold in righteous pursuits. And the purpose of this has nothing to do with our reputations or really to do with making the world a a better place to live. Rather, Jesus says, let your light shine before people in order that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. The ultimate aim is the reign and the praise of God. Having been brought up in uh, churches from a very young age, I've uh, heard my fair share of testimonies, people who've come to the Christian faith, and more than a few have said something along the lines of one of the things that both irritated them about Christianity and attracted them to it was that as they watched uh, Christian friends they had live and work, they realized that the Christians had something that they didn't. And it was this that pushed them to question and to search and ultimately turn to Jesus and to praise God. The practice of Jesus' disciples clearly makes it clear that this passage certainly doesn't bypass the need to preach and teach and explain the Christian message. This is not a case of preach the gospel and, if necessary, use words But the message we preach cannot be divorced from the way we live. And as we live out the values of God's kingdom, we are to do so in a way that points people not to us, but to the source of this distinctive way of life, our Father in heaven. And Jesus says that that this is because by this, God brings people to faith in Christ. He brings people into his kingdom. Where do we fit into the world? Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before people that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Let's pray together. We thank you, Father, for your word which gets into the corners of our lives which gets into into a world without you and we pray father that you might help us to hear jesus words this evening that you might help us to uh, hear them in their um, in their discomfort that we might hear their challenge and that by your strength and by your grace we might be uh, effective uh, flavorful salt and bright light to the world. Amen.